Thank you for that um, stellar panel. I think I'll just stand here. You can all see me. So um, we, are, we are cruising through very nicely. So we've um, looked at strategic partnerships. And now we are moving on to the context of PropTech in the East Africa real estate market. Um, and for that panel, we're going to have Paul Masharia, um, the CEO of Kiotape. Um, he'll be joined by Patricia Njeri, the Director of Business Development at Ezen Financials, um, Trevor Kimani, co-founder and CEO Alpha Block, Linus Wahome, founder Man Pro Systems, um, Jesse Adonis, um, account executive at MRI Real Estate Software, and Robert Gitemi, um, MD at SciTech um, IoT. Um, lady and gentlemen, okay, gentlemen, you have 40 minutes. To uh, the women in the room. But uh, nevertheless, we will proceed. Uh, so when we talk about uh, PropTech in East Africa, definitely Tilda has highlighted where we are as far as um, pairing with our colleagues in the rest of Africa. Um, good story is um, despite where we position ourselves, uh, there's still quite a lot that is happening as it will be coming, becoming very clear from my panelists. So I'll be engaging them directly in some of the amazing things that they're doing in the continent. And specifically, we're looking at, again, all the attention that is given to real estate, uh, which is actually an opportunity that is driven by, I mean, highest rate of urbanization, uh, young working population in the continent, and you know, the, the, you know, the rise of AI application in uh, real estate, augmented uh, reality and artificial intelligence as well, whether it's how houses are screened, how, whether it's how spaces are managed, whether it's how transactions are mediated with blockchain technology, uh, offering a temper-proof uh, way in which transactions happen, whether it's how ownership actually takes place, uh, like we'll be hearing here, some of innovative ways that are coming up. So I will begin by just giving them a minute uh, to just introduce themselves, uh, tell us what they're doing, and then we'll pick it from there. Uh, for introductions purposes, like I've mentioned, my name is Paul, um, CEO at Kyotope. Kyotope, we basically work with uh, property players, uh, property operators. We automate the business flows and payments, specifically looking at uh, facility managers, um, and how they operate, how they uh, conduct their workflows, and giving them a walkthrough automation throughout their processes. Uh, so we'll begin with uh, my right, left hand man here, Jesse. <laughs> you can cool. say hi to us. And then we thanks, can... for, uh, thanks for having us and inviting us. It's good to be here today. I'm Jesse Adonis. I represent MRI in the African, Middle Eastern, and Indian Ocean region. Uh, previously at Amazon Web Services, but now trying to solve a couple of property problems. Hi guys, uh, my name is Trevor Kimani. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AlphaBlock. And basically AlphaBlock is helping Africans who are excluded from real estate to create wealth and access real estate as an investment and wealth creation product. Good afternoon, my name is Robert. I'm glad to be here. I'm the CEO of SciTech IoT. So we are basically offering optimization around the utilities in the properties. So we are looking at water, energy, gas, and even the sewerage to just optimize the whole process and uh, incorporate IoT in the utilities. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laina Sohome, founder and CEO of Manpro. So we are in the digital construction project management space. Um, so we are uh, a contact. On a lighter note. And um, what we do is to make sure that people build without losing money, uh, especially when the buildings are being done commercially. So a key focus is on cost control, uh, not just the valuation of the building or the work done, but the actual input cost that goes into the construction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patricia Njeri. I'm a director at Eason Partners Limited. We're a software company. Uh, we deal with property management system, both in uh, residential and commercial real estate. So I'm glad to be here and uh, be of, of course, uh, answer several questions regarding 
Oh, okay. Good, 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 good. A round of applause for them. Uh, I will begin with you, Patricia. Let me do the justice. Um, I know that you are in the property management space, specifically you're working with uh, property managers, both residential and commercial. Um, uh, perhaps you could highlight for us uh, part of uh, the reason why you've been successful, how long you've been in the market, uh, how you made your entry into a highly fragmented and largely informal market. Uh, you could shed some light on that. Well, um, Ethan, I could say we, this company is uh, heading to 10 years uh, in the business. Um, of course, uh, property, uh, property and uh, property owners and property managers, uh, we've had quite a resistance uh, in the past maybe uh, six, uh, six years ago. But uh, in the last four years, uh, maybe because of COVID and everything, uh, we, ca we can see we've seen um, a lot of improvements, especially in the tech world uh, for property, prop tech. Um, we find that um, we, we um, the, the people in the property, uh, the, lead, the leading companies in property management and also property owners do not really embrace the technology uh, bits here in Kenya or even in Africa. So it has been quite hard to penetrate through this market. But of course, uh, based on what we provide, the systems that we provide, because we provide uh, a holistic system that deals with uh, not only property management, it does your finances, it does your, um, you, you want to see how you're going to perform maybe in the next five years. So we provide like a holistic system. So this is what has enabled us maybe to be in the leading, uh, to, to be able to provide a, a solution to these people who are a bit conservative and uh, at least open up this market for you know other players in the market who are coming after us. So it has been quite hectic, but I'm uh, with the uh, people are opening up to technology nowadays. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, so Robert, I'll come to you. And um, so one of the things about technology is that there's always um, sometimes a disconnect between something that sounds fancy, something that looks good and the actual application of it, and perhaps you could tell us uh, in what ways that um, your IoT solutions have been applied, and what kind of benefits that have been passed on both to developers, managers, and even the end users who might be the tenants who live in those spaces. All right, thank you. Um, I think statistically, it's actually known that 30% of the energy that we generate actually goes to waste. So that means in every bill that a property manager pays or an owner, 30% of it can actually be saved through optimization. So what we have done is that uh, we are now trying to optimize all the energy points at the property level, uh, be it water, be it power, be it gas, or uh, some bit, I'll talk some bit about uh, even the sewerage systems to try and see whether we can actually save on those key components. So maybe I can highlight, in terms of power, uh, you find that there is always a culture of uh, wastage uh, that, I mean, it cuts across uh, all of us, whether in our homes or even in the industries. So we put the IoT meters that actually are able to do the real-time monitoring of even how appliances are used. So how we have done it differently is that we use a last mile concept. So instead of just measuring your power at the source, we can be able to go to the last mile and even check particular appliances um, that we think could be the cause of your rising bill. Same thing with water. I think for us our mantra is every drop counts. So you find that from the point of generation, pumping to the end user, there's a lot of wastage that happens in there. But because you don't have the data, then you can't really trace even where the wastage is taking place. So we come in with the IoT meters that can monitor real time. There is a platform that you're able to check in, and then you're able uh, to see where wastage could be taking place. Real time reports for you. And these real time reports are for the owner, the property manager, and even the tenant. 
In terms of sewerage, uh, we have some IoT meters that are able to check for any contamination that is likely to take place. I think it's a constant threat for all of us in Kenya and across the, uh, Africa. So we are able to check for those parameters using our meters, again in a real time. Because if you detect it three weeks late, then you might be in trouble. So that's what we are doing in that space. Yeah. Okay, let me come to you, Jesse. Um, I know that MRI have been in the market for perhaps more than 40 years, if I'm not wrong, and more than in uh, 170 countries. I am so aware that you've made some acquisitions in PropTex. And perhaps um, in light with uh, the previous discussions on partnerships and uh, areas of growth, uh, perhaps what would be your uh, views on uh, what we need to do as the PropTech uh, um, ecosystem in East Africa for us to be able to grow perhaps to those levels that we can either be acquired or even acquire new players? <laughs> Good question. I think um, you mentioned 40 odd years in 170 countries, right? Uh, that's a ton of strategic acquisitions. Uh, some are for uh, you know, vertically integrating up into existing solutions, others are for market segments and to place things like API layers above them. Uh, I think if you could draw any lessons away from MRI operating over the last couple of years in East Africa, it would be twofold. The first would be to have, I think, a sound vision of, of where you want to take your, your business uh, and your, your solution stack or your tech stack. Uh, and then being flexible and pragmatic enough to set and achieve those goals to get there. Um, not all of it will be you know, through, through acquisition, not all growth is through acquisition, uh, but some are, are on most are, are really being pragmatic about what the problems you can solve in front of you and uh, what you can introduce to the market. You know, tech for the sake of tech, like we heard, and I, I don't want to be, um, what's the word? I don't want to be, uh, you know, creating a, a, a dissent into the last panel discussion, but there was a, a voice that stated that we needed to scale as quick as possible and build solutions as quick as possible. And that's a cool sentiment. But in reality, when you're building a tech business from the ground up, I think being pragmatic to solve problems in front of you is, is really your first goal. Amazing, amazing. Uh, Trevor, let me come to you. And um, I think you as uh, we actually explaining what PropTech is. So definitely we need more about fractional uh, ownership. <laughs> so perhaps you could um, enlighten us more about what you're doing. And then um, in that line also, tell us what you're doing to educate more people and to drive more uptake towards fractional ownership. Thanks, yeah. Um, so simply fractional ownership is buying a piece of an asset, right? Like you could buy a share of Apple stock or you could buy a share of an asset, uh, like an apartment or maybe a full, maybe the Burj Khalifa, for example. Um, but what we're doing at Alpha Block is making the idea of investing in real estate not, you know, scary. Because our customers are between the ages of 24 and 35. They've probably never invested in real estate before. So maybe they get a bonus at the end of the year, 100,000 shillings or a million shillings, depending on where you work. And um, they're thinking, how do I make sure by the time I'm getting married, my money is there and it can start paying for diapers and school fees in, in a few years. And they're looking at real estate, but they do not know how to make that decision. So the main thing is fear that's stopping people from being able to invest. But you realize that fear is just a product of lack of knowledge. So we look at what key aspects are people actually afraid of, what, losing their money to fraud, investing and having an emergency and not being able to access the value that they've been used to invest, and uh, making the right decision in terms of investing. So being younger um, clientele, they, they're sitting on Instagram, scrolling, and uh, you'll find a small blurb about real estate investing isn't supposed to be difficult. And that's how we're trying to educate them, to show them that use this framework of thinking so that you can now become more confident and make the decisions on your own. And whether it's 100,000 shillings or a million bob, you can start investing with the money that you have. Amazing, amazing. Great, great. Um, let me come to you, Linus. Um, I know construction projects have very many pin-sticking details. 
Are you dealing with both formal and informal people in those projects? Uh, so perhaps you could tell us uh, what, how you're using your software to be able to kind of uh, steer project management as, as, a, as an element of the um, real estate industry. So these properties you're talking about, they have to be built by someone. And the process of building, as you said, can be very taxing. Uh, I think for many of us, when you think about construction, there are so many details you think about, materials, labor, you know, the timelines and all that. Now the challenge is that a lot of these projects, actually a Deloitte report, uh, 2019 report shows that 90% of projects are managed manually. The, re the, the net effect of that is that uh, controlling your costs as an investor becomes very difficult when information is scattered all over the place. So today, any construction project you go to is being managed through an Excel sheet, uh, WhatsApp groups, and you know, uh, pen and paper kind of thing. So when you are over procuring materials, so your fundi comes and tells you, you know, we need a, an extra 100 bags of cement. Now you have to take time to go back to your Excel sheets and reconcile what have we bought so far uh, versus what is being requ requested. So where our solution comes in is in that real-time tracking of uh, the resources, um, the, the timelines, and most importantly, the costs, so that you do not experience cost overruns and uh, you only get to discover this later when you do the reconciliations. So where tech becomes important is in making sure that you avoid cost overruns in your construction projects on a real-time basis, and the net effect then is that that construction the cost is not inflated, because someone has to bear that cost. You know, it will not be the contractor, it will not be the property developer, it will eventually be the customer. So what we come to do is to make sure that there is operational efficiency in the construction phase of these properties. Thank you. Um, so Patricia, coming back to you, and one of the things that um, is so I, it's a kind of a discussion that uh, exists in real estate market is around uh, regulation and protection of data. And I know serving uh, hundreds of property managers, uh, that means you're dealing with data uh, for tenants and data for those properties as well. So what kind of efforts do you put in place to protect uh, these uh, personal data that uh, you come across in the course of your business? Um, looking at the Data Protection Act of Kenya, Article 31 C and D also have been licensed as data handlers and uh, uh, by the uh, Data Protection Act of Kenya. So there is no way that uh, your data is uh, misused or we will be uh, messed up if you use our system. So that is what we do, uh, making sure that the data is pro protected, especially um, the critical information uh, for the landlords and uh, property managers, that's uh, regarding to payment, regarding to tenant information, uh, contact information, and all that. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, Trevor, uh, in the same light, um, I'm not sure where our fractional ownership lies in, uh, but in terms of regulation, uh, are you working with CMA? Are you pursuing the, uh, any form of regulatory framework? Um, I understand uh, fractional ownership is definitely not a rate. Uh, so what are you doing uh, as far as compliance regression is concerned? Yeah, um, luckily for us, uh, CMA has a sandbox. And the sandbox is something that allows an innovative company to innovate. Um, REITs also are not necessarily cast in stone in terms of the structure or how you design the REIT, although there are some rigid aspects of a REIT that you must follow. But we wouldn't even come close to saying that we're a REIT at this stage. But long term, you never know. But what we've done is from day one, we've engaged the regulator, kept them close, and let them know exactly how we're designing the product. And uh, the baseline regulations, even from a REIT perspective and simple co um, co consumer protection perspectives, are what we've used to design what we have as a base product. And then anything we've been doing that isn't within the regulations, we inform the regulator that this is what we're thinking about. We don't go and do it and then come back. We say this is what we're thinking about. And we just get the feedback from them and see 
what they feel about uh, this particular structure of product, this particular structure of communication and uh, titling in the ownership. So it's, it's been, I would say it's been good. Um, they're open for us to iterate these certain uh, customer feedback uh, information that we're getting, which is really important. I, I know the perspective we had maybe from a different regulator, I think Central Bank with the previous regime is totally different. It's either you do what they say or you can't do anything at all. So this is going to create a good environment for innovation and bring out really good products that create um, wealth creation products in this market. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, Robert, just uh, as a follow-up question to your earlier feedback, um, perhaps you could provide for us uh, specific cases where IoT solutions have been implemented and what kind of uh, improvement or changes that has happened, whether in terms of the energy savings, whether it's in terms of the increased efficiency, perhaps you could give us such examples. All right, thank you. Um, I think in the area of water, We've been able to roll out a few projects that allow the property owner to actually remotely be able to build their customers. I think um, one of the challenges we had with some of the property owners is that there is one meter coming in uh, from the source and then there, there is no meter uh, going out to the 30 tenants. Um, so I think it has been an issue of estimation, uh, capturing the entire bill, trying to distribute it to the tenants. And I think what we've done for them then is that there is an IoT meter for every client, and this IoT meter is automated. So it's able to generate the number of units that have been used every month and then share that report with the property owner, uh, with the property manager, and even with the client. So, so to speak, I think it's an element of transparency. Um, I mean, um, I think it has also been the opaqueness that sometimes the client will be billed with a 5K bill for water, but they are not really sure whether they are the ones who consumed the water or they are not the ones. There is no way of proving for both parties. So in that uh, setup, then we've been able to roll out a few projects with a developer and now they are able to um, very efficiently build their clients. And even the clients can be able to have some corrective procedures in terms of how the usage of the utility is at their facility. In terms of energy, uh, we are able to even schedule operations of particular uh, appliances. We had a case scenario um, with a microfinance where there were some appliances running through the night because they are in rooms that are under lock and key. So in such a case, then you're able even to schedule what time can this appliance come on, what time can it go off. At the end of the month, we are trying to see, were we able to reduce your bill by this 30% uh, that goes to waste? Even if we don't capture the entire 30%, then we are able to see significant drop in your bill. Ultimately, we are looking to be able to help our property owners and managers to even do the billing uh, because for instance, in the hotel industry, do you know what component of what you charge your client can actually be attributed to your utilities, like the power, um, like the water, and so on? So we want to get to a place where we can even help the uh, particular industry verticals to really go to the last mile and see, this is the cost of my power, this is the cost of my energy. Um, as, as, as a component of the entire bills that you pay um, in that facility. So those, those are some of the things we've been able to do. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Sorry, just before we go, I had a question there for Rob, and maybe I missed it, but in terms of the, of the, the owner billing backwards towards the tenant, um, between the tenant's you know, meter reading or water reading, where's the comparison report to ensure that we're billing the correct, the correct, uh, the correct value based on the usage? So what we do is that we don't just in install one meter. We actually capture all the areas where there could be possible discrepancies. For instance, if you talk about power, there is the meter from KPLC, then there is your meter, then you have some tenants that are able to share one or two meters. So you have to do a last mile sort of thing so that I can tell you what is directly attributable to a particular client or a particular tenant. Yeah, thanks. Oh, okay, uh, so before I come to the audience, I, so I want to ask you, Jesse, um, I know data and data analytics is still 
a very a word that is disconnected from most of us. Uh, so in what ways are you are leveraging on data and analytics to be able to help the businesses that you work with uh, in real estate? Yeah, good question. Um, I think when, you know, initially when I think of data analytics and uh, intelligence reporting, I think of super cumbersome large enterprise solutions. I'm not going to name some of them. Uh, but essentially, how we do that is fairly straightforward. We have to ensure that the data that we're building from, like the master data that we're pulling from, is in a structured framework. And that means having a, a place to house all of your data. So the tenant record, the entity record, the billing record, et cetera, et cetera. Making sure that it's on the correct tech stack, making sure that the system is agile enough to report back. Uh, and then I think reporting takes care of itself. Um, but the key is to have a, in this case, a PM solution with PM functionality that's completely integrated backwards towards your accounting. Oh, okay, oh, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so let me give, open it to the audience. Uh, perhaps you can take one or two questions. Yeah, Michael. And, and, and as you answer, you ask your question. Let me ask you a question. Uh, I know you're an operator. So as an operator, would you rather work uh, with a prop tech, or do you rather have a custom-made solution for you? You can ask that is. I'll answer after um, ask my questions. Yeah. <laughs> so my name is Michael Canu. I'm a developer. Uh, I'm a tech guy, and I'm also a love prop tech, and I'm a board member of KPDA. Um, so my first question, and this is not in a bad way, huh? but it's so hard to find you guys. Let me give you an example. I've been looking for smart metering solutions. And we are going to India and South Africa, and we're in Kenya, but we don't know you guys are offering these solutions uh, locally. So my challenge, that PropTech Association, please. So, because we have many guys I know, even for property management, South Africa, India, because guys don't know, Nigeria. So please, make it easy for us to find uh, you guys. Uh, my second question what one thing outside funding can we help you guys with? Okay, anyone who'd want to ask, Linus? <laughs> I think for me, uh, from a construction point of view, and I think it also relates to a lot of the people, um, I think education, educating the market is really, really important. Um, I mean, construction, property, we just saw the, the, the statistics here in terms of the number of uh, you know, tech solutions that are in this space and the funding that's going to that and the recognition that, that the space is being given from a tech point of view. I think there's a need of a lot of education, educating um, the market on the tech solutions that are there for whatever it is that they're doing because these spaces have been managed in a certain way for the longest time. And I feel, especially for my space, people don't know any other way, any other better way to do it. Uh, so if forums are created, and you know these kind of forums, there's a lot of education. Uh, I may be wrong, but please uh, help me. Um, maybe to add on to that, I would like to say that uh, we have a very resistant market. Um, what happens is uh, Kenyans do not trust Kenyan products. So uh, the tech, the prop tech, the group uh, here, I'm sure they have encountered, uh, you know, those limitations. The problem is you approach someone, but they'd rather get a system from abroad, knowing very well that uh, we have Kenyan problems, which needs to be solved with Kenyan systems. We have very educated people here in Kenya, in the tech world, people who have developed systems that are imaginable. We go for a presentation, people are like, do you have, this is a system that has been made in Kenya. But the problem is Kenyans need to embrace Kenyan products. That is my, th that is what I think should, we should, we, sh we should all start from there. Embrace Kenyan products and then from there, we'll, you, you don't even need to go to Nigeria. I mean, we have better systems than Nigeria. We have better systems than South Africans. It's only that we need Kenyans to embrace Kenyan products. Yeah, I think we love it at that. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Sorry, uh, let, me, uh, let me answer his okay, question. Okay, okay. You, you asked him a very good question on whether an operator should handle the technology. Yeah. And you heard what Hannah said before as a security company trying to figure out how to build their own technology. You're going to make so many mistakes that are going to cost so much money 
and, and you'll end up creating an environment where you feel like this technology is not worth it. So you'd rather focus on your core competences. Build, um, the build the assets, make the assets work, but find a partner that you can work with to help you use the technology to make your product sellable in the market. And that way you actually scale very quickly. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I think we, we're good. Okay, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you so much to the panelists and to Michael for bringing in the heat in the room. Um, I'm sure I, I don't think any of them answered your question in terms of financing, but that shows that um, we should all be ready with the elevator pitches. So I'm sure they'll answer it offline. <laughs>